When I came here, I definitely changed my view on um, a lot of things. It's the reason, also one of the actually main reasons why I, I came here was I was working corporate. I was working with big pharmaceutical companies. There is uh, very strict, uh, rigid systems of how you do all your work and. Uh, having clients as big pharmaceutical companies uh, makes you work very long. Then coming here on a two-month vacation uh, where uh, time is a little bit <laughs> not, not so important. Uh, from the business I was in waiting for somebody for a meeting if they were like one or two minutes late, that was not accepted coming here and you said like shouldn't we meet at 12 and they come at 2 like I said in the start it was very frustrating but later on when you just let go of time as this strict thing and have it more like a elastic time like I mentioned then also kind of the pressure and the ease that it gives you and the possibilities to enjoy the countryside and the nature and the people around you without stressing about time it's so nice yeah and unfortunately my friends in Norway they have to deal with me now because I'm a mulching man now <laughs> My name is Eric. I'm from Norway. Uh, moved to Denmark, studied architecture and art. Focus a lot on sustainability. Uh, but from my childhood, I grew up a lot in uh, the nature. My father was writing books about nature. So even if I grew up in a city, I was always very connected with nature. When I then moved to Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, where I lived and studied for 10 years. Um, I kind of felt like this drag along getting back in nature. In 2017, I took two months vacation, went to Mongolia uh, 
to ride horse, learn how to ride horse. And I did actually ride 1,500 kilometers, which was a quite a long ride. And I really enjoyed the, the hospitality I found in the countryside here. I visited many cities, but uh, for me, uh, I felt like uh, there was a quite big cultural change every time I went from being on amongst the nomads where the hospitality was amazing, the service was amazing, like uh, like everything, like uh, people almost dragged me into their gears and served me tea. And then I come to these gear camps and service suddenly just turned upside down, which I found very surprising because here I'm actually paying for a service and then there was no service at all. And I didn't understand, like, how can it be like this, that, like, wherever I go on the countryside, I get, like, the, so many good people that serve me everything. And then coming to a gear camp, um, or some of the gear camps that um, didn't serve me, I didn't, like, things were forgotten. It was, like, suddenly I forgot about the breakfast and, like, these small things that was just missing out. So... When I did my trip, uh, horse riding trip, I started actually to avoid cities and just stayed amongst the nomads, met some people that wanted to go into tourism. I was like very triggered by the thought of uh, going into tourism here because I could see like from the perspective of the culture you find on the countryside, it's so suited for tourism here and still there is not many people out in the nature and so on. So when I started to find a, a place where I could open um, a business and uh, a, a camp, uh, I was very focused on finding a place where I didn't have other uh, camps around or not being in a city. I wanted to be away from roads, I wanted to be out where I felt the most hospitality the first time I came to Mongolia. When coming from a different culture and starting a business in a new culture that you don't actually know that well, um, you run into a lot of challenges. Um, but uh, for me, uh, moving forward and kind of trying to keep my timelines when establishing a business here, working uh, so far away from Ulaanbaatar, because when most of this was established, there were no roads between Dachan and Ulaanbaatar. So getting uh, the qualified uh, personnel was uh, difficult. Um, I've been trying also from a sustainable perspective when it comes to social sustainability is to involve the local community as much as possible. For us, having local people because I'm I'm selling, selling I'm selling Jachtland to tourists. That's that's my product. Having local people that are proud of their product selling it <clears throat> would absolutely be the best uh, alternative or the best way of uh, approaching it. I think. Um, of course, when building a structure and buildings that uh, are also a new technology, even for Mongolia. Um, because it's the first glue lamp structured building here, I believe. Um, it is very difficult to have a, a good timeline because these few experts that you might find in Ulaanbaatar uh, don't have really time to come all the way out here when it takes 10 hours to drive when there is no road. And Construction has been quite a big challenge. HR also, it's difficult being far away because a lot of people choose to move to Ulaanbaatar when they have qualification. And I'm very lucky that I have found also some people that I have managed to uh, bring back out of UB and that have moved closer by here and work here full time. I believe that uh, Mongolia will 
have much more tourists in the future. I think it also will take more time because I think it's uh, the biggest problem is awareness amongst a lot of the people operating um, about what is important for different kind of cultures. Some cultures really appreciate some things and some do something else. For example, as me as a Norwegian, that I can get my good cup of coffee in the morning and not like an instant coffee, for example. It's like that you get like a proper good coffee. I think it would go for the same if Mongolians traveled abroad, that they can get their good milk tea. To just remember that all different cultures have different things that would make them feel very comfortable um, in terms of food and in terms of mattresses and so on because when I came here the first time it was something I actually struggled with was my sleep because uh, mattresses were incredibly hard. I know in Asia that's a normal thing but it was one of the first tasks when I started this place was to find like mattresses that could be for the European clientele um, and toilets should be of a proper good standard uh, and like water closet is a minimum uh, it's not something extra and also here in mongolia now like these systems they are very well developed and easy to install in most gear camps for example with normal water system for toilets uh, and sewage systems it's more the scandinavian culture we don't have a culture where we pursue luxury uh, we have a culture that we pursue uh, comfort in a much higher value than having something fancy. That's why we really try to uh, make beds as comfortable as possible and the stay as comfortable as possible as well. We also a society where efficiency is uh, very important. So the challenge here is to grab some of these elements and combine with uh, the Mongolian way of uh, being at ease without rushing anything. It's about priorities, I think. So you can prioritize what's most important for our guests. Uh, it was uh, from 2019 when I moved here. Uh, it was the first thing to do is exploring the area around, especially the mountains. And also one of the reasons why I chose to come here was also the diversity in nature. So on, we have on one side, we have the more easy slope mountains, beautiful to go horse riding in. Uh, and then on the other side, we have more steep mountains, uh, perfect for mountain biking and yeah, for the more exploring. And I think it's one of the most beautiful places in Mongolia. So I go there a couple of times every year and yeah, uh, enjoying the nature there. This forest goes all the way back to Norway, actually, which is very nice. Yeah. In this area, there is so much fruits, so much berries, so much uh, edible plants. In the mountains on this side, you have like the ulantoms and uh, different flowers and lots of um, thyme and uh, herbs that you can eat. So we try also to buy from the locals uh, like in the spring you have the halyar and so on that we try to purchase which they're picking yeah. and then put it on the menu so we try to have like a seasonal menu in the kitchen where we combine in everything the nature around us offer some nice fresh chilies these are spicy this really kicks up the food if you want to and we do some mexican food sometimes and these ones they do the trick Mmm. Mmm. You shamar hoyr. Tegeed hamgin turunt nagha baltu kwa kwa yon. Ke bur turl buri nagha. Yasta turl buri nagha afchen. Tegeed chinjunud, salat wajca. Tegeed thumus manchen zoon, hurum manchen. 
тэгэл бүх юм авч ийн одоо тэгэл энэ шарц хэсгийг хүртэл одоо хэдэн хэдээр нь авч ийн шүү дээ these flowers we use for tea um but for me personally i'm i'm much more interested in the root the root is called sunroot full name is jerusalem artichoke it has nothing to do with artichoke but it has like this earthy nutty taste so if you have for example a steak or some red meat and then together with the, the puree of uh, of this sunroot it's just a perfect combination for the autumn <laughs> Эрики ажлын амжилтын төлөө. Сайхан I don't have a family of my own, but my uh, parents in Norway and of course and my sister, my siblings. Uh, but they have my, especially my father, he's been here many times. Like five times, but he comes like at least one month at a time. So he has also been very helpful here during the construction times and so on. My father been writing books about nature, been very uh, focused into nature and uh, himself he had an office work job. So he's been like, when he had the possibility, he also always reached out to nature. And I think when he saw me uh, changing my life from office and being in nature full time, uh, I think he very supported the choice. I think he really hoped that I chose some nature a little bit closer to home. But uh, um, but he also enjoys coming here and staying here for longer periods of time every time he comes and uh, love exploring the nature, uh, also the culture. And he also have now many friends in the area here that he keeps in contact with. Uh, yeah without me being connected in that part, which is very nice. So Eurolodge is uh, off-grid, so we are not connected to electricity, we are not, there is no pipes coming here, um, so we need to have our own energy. So for electricity we have uh, solar panels. Uh, solar panels, super good, but you also need a big battery bag, bag uh, bank, but um, with a big uh, battery bank it's also a big investment. On the other hand, you don't need to pay for your electricity in the future, which is very nice. So, so this is the battery bank for the gears and utilities, like all the water pumps and these kind of things. And then we have one battery bank that goes for main building alone. So it's two separate systems. There is, behind the bathtubs here, there is also one UPS system. So cameras and water and so on always runs even when the rest shuts down. So uh, sustainability, normally it means a bigger investment upfront and very low running costs later on. With doing the bigger investment in the start also it's sustainable for nature and environment. Um, so the next step we were building up on was uh, hot water. Uh, solar thermal. It's uh, gas pipes that collects the heat from the sun and directly heat up uh, circulating water. Uh, these are three times as more uh, as efficient as solar electricity. So you get a lot of uh, energy in a yeah in a very easy and on short time. It's more difficult to store uh, hot water but it's very possible. You just need big water tanks. Um, then uh, we have solar to air and earth pipes. 
So we collect solar heat in the in the winter, just heating up air. So when you have the ventilation, it blows in hot air. Um, it's not efficient, of course, during nighttime, but in combination with earth pipes and that goes down in the ground, so the air goes down in the ground and then up in the building, it also takes uh, the temperature from the ground. So if you have minus 40 outside and maybe down in the ground, it's minus 10, the air gets closer to the minus 10. So you don't bring in minus 40. So that when air then comes into the building, um, we have uh, something called an HRV. So it's a heat recovery system. So the air that goes out of the building crosses the air that comes in they don't mix, so it goes in thousand small layers. And when it mixes together in all the, or not mixes, but when they uh, pass each other with all these thin layers between, uh, it takes up all the heat that you are blowing out. So you can change the air, uh, so you get fresh air in, but you keep the temperature. Yeah, which is very good way and you can have much uh, higher change uh, of air in a building when you're doing this. And then, of course, the building needs to have very good insulation. So uh, in this building, we have 40 centimeters of insulation in the roof, and we have 33 centimeters of insulation in the walls. Um, and this, of course, makes you not uh, lose a lot of the energy. And the heating is not only solar thermal today, uh, because what I built at first was a test facility for solar thermal, but uh, we're also using now gas as a backup LPG, which is unfortunately a little bit expensive. But uh, when we're building uh, a higher and higher uh, system for the solar um, thermal, we can reduce the use of gas. The solutions I have here for off-grid is some of them are very low uh, invest and some are my, uh, much higher investment. On. For example, solar thermal, which is very cheap and very easy to run for any household uh, in Mongolia. Um, you can use it in as many ways as you want. You use it for the hot water that you shower or you can use it for heating in your building. Um, so during uh, winter, you can have a more stable temperature in your house, combined with, of course, insulation, which is the key to any good uh, quality of a house. Uh, I would say a, a minimum of uh, a normal insulation would be 25 to 30 centimeters in a wall when you have a cold climate. In Norway, by rule, you would not be able, if you're using normal insulations, then 28 centimeters is the absolutely minimum by, by law in Norway. And unfortunately, what I can see uh, in a lot of the villages uh, is that uh, they don't actually use insulation at all. They maybe have like five, 10 centimeters of insulation, which results in them using a lot of coal, which then results in a lot of pollution. And you have like really bad air and the key factor to it is because they don't use insulation. Actually, when doing this, my engineer, he said like, no, 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 your drawings, because I made all the drawings myself and it's like, this is really stupid. He said, you have way too much insulation. And then <laughs> I said like, no, no, I'm actually thinking of adding more. And it's like, yeah, but you don't need that. You can reduce this and this and this, and it's still legal. And I said like, why, why would that? take away the insulation then I will pay much much more for heating but uh, he kept on insisting that no take away the insulation you don't really need it and I said like nah like 10 centimeter 15 centimeters of insulation that's what you could do like south in uh, Europe where we have hot winters like you can protect from a like a chilly night but you can't really protect for like a minus 40 for months then I would say you should go for the 30 centimeters of insulation um, of two reasons, air quality for you and your neighbors and the environment uh, in general, and 
also because you get a uh, more comfortable inner temperature when you have it, because you don't get temperatures running up and down all the time. You can have it much more stable with a small heating source. Yeah, so you save money on heating. That, but the problem I think in Mongolia is that heating is so cheap. That's why people don't care that much about how much coal they burn. But if coal was illegal and you had to use, for example, gas like I do, uh, and spending uh, a monthly salary per month on heating, then of course you would have changed this quite quickly with good windows and good structures. Yeah. When I came here and had my first winter, or I was supposed to have my first winter in Ulaanbaatar, I was not afraid of the cold weather. I'm, I lived up north in Norway for a year as well. It's also minus 40 and then there is actually no sun either north in Norway during the winter. So it was completely dark and minus 40. I had no problem with it. But when I moved to Ulaanbaatar, there was the pollution. And for me, staying maybe for three, four days, it's okay, but having this extreme pollution for a long term made me actually fly back to Norway. Uh, because at that point I didn't have a place on the countryside and I did not want to give my lungs this experience. Um, so between 2018 to 2019 I had most of the winter in Norway and traveled back and forth because of the conditions that you had was for me uh, shocking first when I came but also um, I, yeah it, for me it was just too much um, to get used to so quickly because I had only visited during the summer and I had been one winter here uh, between 2017 to 2018 but then I was on the countryside and there were absolutely no pollution and I had a very good experience and of course I've been reading about it and I knew there was some pollution but the amount of pollution uh, was shocking and for children or families and so on I find it um, not livable in Ulaanbaatar from end of November till until mid of February um, and in Norway we have big cities but uh, you can always be in contact with uh, nature because you're close by and when you're in the city you don't have the pollution even if it's winter because the source of uh, heating is different. I think most youth in UB can see the beauty on the countryside of Mongolia, all four seasons. Uh, I'm very sure they know about it and they have uh, the need to get or the desire to be out in the nature. Um, but for a lot of youth, uh, before they get uh, into families, uh, it's about social perspectives as well because they want their modern lifestyle um, and I think when you get out and there is more and more places out on the countryside where you can actually find this modern uh, way of working, modern way of living, um, it just takes them a little bit more time 
on the research and finding these places. But you can see it in Hof School, you can see it here at our place. We operate by modern standards of working and you have the flexibility and of course also the responsibility. But you will be able to uh, have a combination of a good social life and a good work life and the nature, which I think it's like the great bonus in life is to have a lot of nature around you. Sustainability, you need to look at all aspects of a business. So not only looking at how you do it with plastic or recycling uh, or the energy. It's a combination of everything, even how your guest is arriving. Uh, the original plan was the, uh, with this place was uh, to uh, main focus on the tourists coming by train from Russia with the Trans-Siberian, the Trans-Mongolian line. And uh, we would bring them down here in a full sustainable lodge and then back on the train. The train is uh, when it comes to pollution, doesn't give much pollution per person uh, compared to a car. Unfortunately, at the moment, the fast train is not going to Dachan anymore, and I really, really hope it comes back. <laughs> Other uh, parts of the sustainability is uh, thinking and planning uh, in ways that 
uh, doesn't do any environmental damage. It also comes down to educating the people in the area when it comes to throwing out trash. Awareness is the most uh, important. Awareness about throwing out trash, awareness about using coal, awareness uh, about uh, your, your carbon footprint in general. That uh, it's not about only if you use a recycled cup or if your straw is plastic or paper. Uh, I don't think that has much impact in the big picture, uh, of course, if you focus on everything else, but the carbon footprint of uh, your um, heating, for example, is so much higher than what it is if you use a plastic bag or a plastic straw. So I would say like maybe focusing on the big things before focusing on the small things. For the countryside, uh, as it is now, it's quite complicated for a lot of the professions to move out uh, when it comes to engineering, because you're depending on other bigger companies that needs to establish out here first. But when you can see more and more um, tourist camps that uh, really sells the countryside of Mongolia, uh, the more you have of them coming out, then it have a drag along uh, on a lot of different uh, needs um, for example engineering like I'm needing here and I think um, the medium cities will be important to supply the medium-sized cities like Dachan Erdnet to supply the countryside around um, in, in many terms uh, like my operational manager uh, moving out of UB, coming to Dachan, and then out here. Um, uh, and the uh, other thing is that the people who are living in the world are living in the world. And the people who are living in the world are living in the world. And the people who are living in the world are living in the бас одоо нөө химэл байгаа тэр нөө стрессээс ч юм зүгтэх зорилго та тэгж тархаа тэгэр сонгосон. Тэгээд яг тархаа хот үед бол зам харилцаа хөгжиж байгаа. Тэгээд бас яг хотын статус та болоход маш их юм байна. Бас цэвэр агаар та. Тэгээд хот гэж хаан бас цөөтөө. Гэтэ ер нь сүүлийн жилүүдэд ер нь ихсэж байгаа. Тэгээд тим учир шалтгааны үднээс ер нь тархаа хотыг сонгоод Тархан дэрсэн. Гэтэе тархан дэрсэн миний ховийн зорилго бол яг би олон жил яг аялж уулчлалаар мэрэгжлийг та баа ажиллаад явж байгаа ч явж ирсэн ч гэсэн зай сүүлийн 4 5 жил махны фирмийн талаар их судалсан. Тэгээ хөдөө аж ахуй. Миний өөр тесөөр мэрэгжлэлтэй хөдөө аж ахуй. Гэтэе ягаад Монголын дундаж одоо төвшөнд тэ одоо ийм цэвэр мах идэж болохгүй байгаа ингэж надад аягүй их том асуулт байсан л та тэгэд одоо чинь том том юм махны фирмүүд Монголд үйл ажиллагаа явуулж байгаа ч гэсэн а тэд нар ерөнхийдөө одоо люкс зэрэглэлийн тэ үнтэй зэрэглэлийн мах гаргадаг тэр болгон хүн 40 мянган гар нэг хэл мах идээд очих чадахгүй тэгэхээр би ягаад тэгвэл цэвэрхэн бас үн боломжийн махыг үлдүүлж болохгүй гэж гэж бодоод энэ дарханыг зорсон а миний бодлоор бол засгийн газраас яг юу ч хүсэмэр нэг тэр яг хөтөө нөхдөө ямар нэгэн мөнгө төгрөг илүү амлахаас илүүгээр те яг тэр амьдрах нөхцөлт энэ яг тухайн бизнес дээр нь яг тийм яг юу гэсэт байгаа дээр нь бас их том боломж гаргалах гэж хэрэг. There is many similarities in like how using the nature living in the nature between especially then uh, Sweden, Norway and Mongolia. Uh, Denmark have a different way of uh, uh, with nature, they don't have that much nature. It's a very small country, a lot of people. Norway is very similar to Mongolia in the population. I think Norway have a couple of more people than Mongolia, but not much. Norway is a very long country. Even if you live in a city, people always go out in nature uh, to kind of, when they have holidays and in weekends and so on. And uh, using the nature uh, is very similar. The difference I see is very present is unfortunately that people throw away litter uh, in the nature here. Um, I have also seen that gets much better, um, but for me that one is very 
difficult to understand why, for example, how you respect mountains and rivers, uh, and at the same point you can open your car window and throw trash out of the window. I have big difficulties understanding that part. But uh, like I said, um, especially in this area, I would say also from the government side that they have, uh, they go out and they clean up in the spring and so on, uh, which uh, I appreciate a lot. And also here in Silling, we have a lot of replanting of trees and, and so on, which I appreciate a lot because uh, using, for example, wood as a building material is really good if you also replant the trees you're taking down, then it's the best way for environments actually to, to build. Last year we made a competition where we had some very nice prizes for people that were uh, learning English because, like I mentioned uh, before, we really want more of the local population here to speak English and we can offer them work if they do. Um, so we had an English speaking competition um, where there was a lot of contestants from uh, the area and this is something we wanted to continue with and maybe making an English speaking competition uh, for the whole of Sling uh, next time we arrange it. As this is the first year of uh, operation, like on proper operation, um, we're taking it a little bit step by step and more and more. Uh, next week we're going to have a music festival here. Uh, last weekend we had uh, the stargazing with also painting and so on, so focusing on the arts. Uh, but uh, in the future I hope we can fill in much, much more so I, I wanted to have uh, on the art and, and sport every week. And when it comes to kayaking, uh, if the river allows, we offer. Yeah. So I do like, uh, I, I have a many Dells and I do like wearing them. So when it comes to Dell shirts, maybe not so often I use Dell shirts, but uh, the traditional Dells, when weather is getting a little bit cold, I really enjoy because when, you have cold nights when you have like this putting on a jacket it only covers half of your body but with uh, a mongolian dell you get like it's like i feel a little bit like uh, home when you take like just the whole duvet the whole blanket around you in the morning and you have a little bit the same feeling with bringing on a dell you just pack yourself in and tuck yourself in which is a very nice feeling and wearing that and of course i also like the the look of the the dells so in the spring, autumn, winter, I use Dells all the time and I have many. Um, I have uh, been partly adopted a little bit by a family in Ahangai and they supply me with new Dells all the time. I have no possibility to wear them out. I'm not sure how many Dells I have, but uh, I would say maybe 15 Dells because they think I should have a new Dell every year. And then you get one Dell for spring and then one for autumn and one for winter. And yeah, so I, I, I have a big collection of Dells. Um, for the tourist industry, uh, I think it's important that the tourist industry also focus on a much longer season uh, and not only selling the summer of Mongolia. Me personally, um, when I was reading up about how is Mongolia and it was recommended every, on all web pages it was recommended to maybe three months that was very recommended but when I moved here I could see like the beauty of like the four seasons in Mongolia it doesn't need to be green in Mongolia to be beautiful uh, I think uh, the spring and the autumn is both really really beautiful here and I think a lot of guests if they knew more about it they from other countries, they would also seek to come here uh, in more of the off seasons. Uh, the more I kind of worked with Mongolia and uh, developing the business plan and so on, I got more and more intrigued all the time. Um, yeah, step by step and here I am. Um, but uh, I think there is um, a lot of possibilities in Mongolia that are not uh, being brought up 
and I hope more people will go into tourism that go into tourism not only for making a lot of money quick they need to have long plans of uh, investment and also they need to do it because they love to be out in nature themselves because if you start a business out on the countryside and you don't like to be on the countryside and you prefer to be in the city um, then you're just at the wrong place because you, you need to be present all the time when you're out here and when you are I think everyone if they can figure out a way to have their family out on the countryside and being able to have like this every day it's really really nice of course it's nice to go to the city sometimes and go to a pub or go to a nice restaurant and so on but uh, being able to dedicate yourself out in the nature here then yeah it's a good quality of life yeah. Thank you.